But for now, we want to talk about, I'm even afraid now to read my intro on uh, the Kenyan shilling. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> he doesn't have the intro for me. They are, they are, they are, they are, in light of what Ali can say. What's the headline? But can I just read what I had prepared yeah, yeah, now that you say no? Yeah, yeah, no okay. All right. Yeah. The Kenyan shilling has started the year on a turbulent note. This is what you don't want to hear. Okay. Slipping to a 15 month low against the US dollar and setting local consumers up for higher cost of imported goods, as well as a steep rise in electricity bills. The shilling opened the year under pressure from importers losing ground to the dollar, according to analysts. This trend is expected to remain throughout the coming weeks, and we may see the regulator stepping in to manage volatility. With Kenya's next presidential uh, election and the legislative, legislative elections scheduled for August 2017, also the Economic Intelligence Unit predicts that political tensions will rise as campaign gathers momentum. Also, in this program, we are keenly looking on how our corporations are faring. Kenya Airways has contracted an international head hunting firm to hire a new chief executive, even as the national carrier gears up for what will be a critical year in its turnaround, <coughs> Michael Joseph, the airline's chairman, said in an interview that the renowned recruiter has kicked off the search for a suitable candidate globally ahead of a target of having a new CEO in place by April. So, but in light of what we are uh, having this year with the elections, we're asking you this question. You can chime in and also you can join the conversation. We're asking you, do you think the economy will be adversely affected by the general elections do you think the upcoming general election is going to be affected by the general election? So, if it is at 15 month low, the ceiling, <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> given what you're it saying, is. it is. It is. It is. It is. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a reality a fact, on the ground. That's a fact, yeah. Yeah. So, is, is that a skewed report? I, I think you are mostly fair. It is at a 15-month low, but other currencies are at much lower levels against the dollar, so I would respond with that. You are correct in what you're outlining. Typically, in election years, a more risky year, growth slows down by an average of 1.4%. A lot will depend on the political rhetoric if the language starts going crazy. And people how the will, media covers it. And how the media covers it. People will start... And how closely fought it's going to be. Mm -hmm. The biggest risks I find in sub-Saharan Africa are closely fought elections mm -hmm. because then the opposition doesn't want to uh, say it's lost and you have all kinds of arguments. So I think those are the dynamics around it and obviously whether there is a potential food-related food inflation shock. But in the context of what's happening globally, in the context of other currencies, the shilling is Teflon. You know, it has been a big outperformer for a very long time. Um, if you compare the volatility in the shilling to any other African currency, it mm. is nothing compared to what we've seen happen in other places, whether it's the Mozambique Metical, whether it's the RAND, the flash crash. The RAND fell last year at one point, nearly 10% in a blink of an eye, early morning. So, and then final point, just to take, up, take on, you were saying whether the central bank would intervene. They have been intervening. Mm -hmm. They've been uh, um, supporting the shilling. I am, uh, and they've been doing that on a regular basis. And there's a sense that maybe they've got to dial down those interventions. It doesn't need to be so aggressive. So, of course, I, they, 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 they I just think Dubao, I think yeah, Dubao, that's what I, I think. mean, look yeah. at the Business Daily headline. Yes. Yeah? Yes. U.S. widens its lead over U.K. Uh -huh. as top importer of Kenyan goods. Yes. Because, you see, the, 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 well, that's what happens if... Uh, the shilling is weaker vis-a-vis -vis the American dollar. Mm -hmm. Our exports, our goods become cheaper and therefore more attractive, attractive yeah. to the American importer. And that is what this headline is saying. So, look, there is nothing the matter that the shilling is at a 15-year low, in, particularly in as far as exports uh, go. Of course, as Ali pointed out earlier, well, what will happen to the cost of food, for example, um, if you couple this with drought and if we have to import food and things and so on. But I think your own headline points to uh, uh, what we keep saying all along, that, that um, uh, perhaps the shilling, in fact, ought to be at about 115 if we want a sustainable uh, export regime. So we must take it always in context. And the headline, the data of that headline, shows that, in fact, you know, there is some benefit to 
uh, a more, shall I say, realistically priced shilling. Uh, and this, this, uh, this general, you know, uh, it's like the idea of having airlines. You know, for a long time, many African countries, small or big, everybody must have a national carrier. I mean, what for? Look, this idea that the shilling or a strong currency is the thing that you need is about a pride thing. It is not good economics. It's very poor economics. I mean, we, I'm telling you, and your headline proves it. It's very poor economics, uh, and it is an emotional argument about is our shilling, you know, some people will say, oh, remember when the Kenya shilling was as strong as the UK pound? I mean, that is just <laughs> bore kabisa economics. But we have the CBK's Monitoring Policy Committee. We'll be meeting this month to actually yeah. uh, address this exchange rate turbulence that we're having. If it's, it's bore economics, why should we even be having a crisis meeting? Look, the, the, there are many things that uh, we do uh, on account of our, our uh, fixation with very bure, useless things. <laughs> Look, <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. Is, it, is it a crisis? Yeah, meeting? is it a crisis? I'm and not is sure. it there turbulence? Is no I mean, you have to keep meeting to it's adjust meeting, to the meeting. external and internal environments. And but again, this comes job. back to it being a headline. <laughs> should the headline be crisis they meeting? Meet every month. And should the purpose be identified as tackling turbulence? All right, but there is some volatility uh -huh. because of all the, the global the, the, the and, and, and domestic globally. issues. Yes. But let's global. not get overexcited unnecessarily in order to generate undue anxiety. But they've been meeting also to try and thrash out you know, the market operations to make a bit the, the, uh, the shilling a bit stable, right? This has been uh, the gesture, I think, this month to try and, and, and do that. But has it moved a needle? Any jots? But you see, Dibal, that is their job. I mean, what? They do this exactly. Yeah. They meet every month to manage these things. Okay. Okay. It, is, it is their job description. Oh. That is why we pay them. Okay. So maybe, it is maybe, not maybe, unusual maybe, that maybe, they maybe, meet. Maybe they there's a crisis. They always meet. Yeah. And I agree that for exporters, having a weaker shilling is something positive. You're able to export and become more competitive. The reality, though, where I disagree with you, is that we're also an importer. So we have to look at the things yes. we're importing because the pressure on the shilling is not good for imports. We're importing raw materials, we're importing spare parts, industrial inputs. So we need to Oceans. look at that side of the coin. But okay. all said and done from the discussions we're having and what we're reading, there's really, the market fundamentals are not really pointing to a crisis around no. the shilling. And there the, is no crisis. The exchange. There's no the, crisis. There is no crisis. Yeah. Okay. And you yeah. see, you see, Dibal, look, okay. for example, we say on the one hand that all oh, companies are closing, but you must also remember companies are opening. I mean, Volkswagen says, okay, we are starting to assemble here, or we're starting to build here, and many others like that. So, uh, uh, and yes, I hear what uh, Phyllis is saying. We must look at our, the way, uh, what we import. But, ultimately, a strong currency makes your exports, and if we're talking about creating manufacturing jobs, yeah, it makes it far much harder to achieve because the size of our, our, our demand side is small. We are dependent. And, and I think, the, actually, the real story ought to have been, I mean, Uganda uh, retains the lead as our uh, biggest uh, export but market. But exports to Uganda uh, dropped by 20%, yes. according to the Bureau of Statistics. Yes, but so this still, is still, reflection. But still there. Yes. yes. So I think that ought to be uh, the case. And it's a good thing we'll be talking okay. about TAC. All right. Fine, fine. We yeah, can because we, we, we also stop for time, so we don't need to be labor the point on this. But moving forward, because we have, we've had the dominance of the dollar, and there has been also uh, questions about the dominance of the dollar. I think the economist also had a very uh, robust expose, not really expose, but uh, a look at the dominance of the dollar. And we had 12 months ago uh, or so, the IMF voted to make the Chinese yuan a reserve currency by adding it to the basket of special drawing rights. Does this also challenged the primacy of the dollar as a means of payment, a store of value, and also uh, a reserve asset. The biggest challenge for China right now is everyone's trying to get out of the Chinese one. Oh, really? Yes. China is bleeding reserve at a speed of about $100 billion a month. It is one of the biggest yeah. macro things happening in the world today is the flight of capital out of China. The Chinese are trying to block it every which way they can. And the economist is writing a lot And the about risk it. here, the risk is they actually bring exchange controls. They have gone down from nearly 4 trillion to 3 trillion. That has happened in 12 months. 
It is Chinese domestic capital that wants to get out of China, right? If you look at volatility in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is totally a proxy for Chinese capital flight right now. Mm -hmm. So an idea, I am not of the view that one, well, you know, that this is made the right time now to start, you know, adding in the Chinese one uh, in, into a basket. I think we should have a more representative basket. You are right, but uh, I think we should be wary about what we put into that basket. And you know, when when you have seven billion dollars of reserves, FX management becomes extremely key, right? You get on the wrong side of a big FX move. Somebody was talking to me yesterday about how much money they get given on grant basis in the pound and saying that it t I took a 20% hit last year. I said, how much did that cost? 10 million pounds. I said, who's managing FX? Nobody, mm -hmm. right? This is a big problem in corporate Kenya. FX management is extremely poor across our corporate. They're all crying out, oh, this has happened on the What are you managing? How are you managing your risk? This is a huge component of your risk, foreign currency borrowing, that kind of thing. So. I'm not bullish on the one right now. No, not but at all. We, we should also be actually wary of the fact that uh, we have a very strong uh, dollar and the dominance of a dollar in the economy, especially that we have a new regime right now. And they, we've seen even previously them tending to use uh, their, 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 their dollar as a, you know, as, as their financial muscle and clout as a political tool. I should think, it really, I think should the really action by the IMF to include China into the basket of uh, foreign currencies is more uh, a political recognition of this of the side of the Chinese economy and uh, and uh, their role their place in the world and so on but so it's, sort of it, a, it's a, not it's expecting anyone to move their reserve from dollar to one especially not at this time but it's just a, a tacit recognition that China is indeed uh, a global Player, player All right. in, in, the, in, the, in the economy. That's, Thank you. That's but I just wanted to say that the budget policy statement, the CS actually mentioned that Kenya will start um, making payments and borrowing in the in, the in other countries, yeah, the currencies. Yeah. They actually mentioned the Chinese yuan. Yeah. Okay. So it moves. It looks like it's a move that Kenya is actually going to make in the in this financial year. All right. Yeah, because of the infrastructure projects, the fact that we are having to repay our debt in in that currency, so they want to remove the reliance on the dollar. But I agree that the Chinese currency is still not. A that's currency that's that yeah. stable that we can yeah. rely on. Okay. That was not IMF's move when they put mm. it in the SDR. All right. Yeah. Uh, I want us to take this conversation around deeper because we have a lot to really cover and we are stuck for time as well. And uh, we've seen recently uh, just in the news that, yes, we had 30, 38 uh, employees going uh, home. This is the plight of K Kenya Airways uh, right now. This has been ongoing since last year. We saw also top uh, directors uh, going home. Uh, also, we'll see the CEO also being shown the door uh, in, uh, in March. And as I had highlighted, that now they're headhunting internationally and they've recruited a firm to actually try and uh, salvage uh, Kenya Airways from where it is right now. He's putting that particular argument that we don't need a national carrier, right? We are the pride of Africa. Right. So why don't we need a, na a national carrier? How can we bring on I, I don't think he said that we shouldn't. Not Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> other, no, no. Other. Small countries. Yeah. Okay, misquoted. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. Not Kenya. Am I right? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're saying, okay, well, what is this notion there? We should dispense with this notion that we should be having national carriers. Maybe how to phrase it. No, no. it. Let, 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 may, I, may I comment on this one? Because, sure. um, you know, we are at neither end of, of the s spectrum. On the one hand, why should we have one at all? And on the other hand, you have other countries which consider their national airline not just another company where you happen to have some shareholding, yes. but it's a national asset of a strategic nature. And the most obvious example is our northern neighbor, isn't it, Ethiopia? Mm -hmm. And we also have the Middle East ones, and we have Turkish Airlines. Mm -hmm. And in each of those situations, it isn't just another company. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, Kenya Airways has pretty much been treated in that way. Also, the Middle East airlines that have been coming here have been allowed much more freedom and flexibility to arrive than Kenya Airways has to go to some of the places. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we do need very much to, again, it's a bit like this SGR. We are where we are with Kenya Airways. Yes, there have been some leadership and management issues that have resulted in these massive losses. Mm -hmm. B uh, but um, I'm not uh, at all convinced that we should do other 
than continue to rebuild this into the private, uh, into the pride of Africa. But the trend, Michael, in this region now is that Tanzania is reviving its national career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rwanda. U the Uganda parliament has approved to revive it. The Uganda parliament yes. airline. Rwanda has it. Djibouti, across uh, the, 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 close to the Red Sea, now has its own airline. So there is this trend that uh, sort of reversed what was happening 15, 20 years ago. Now every country feels it needs to have its own airline. KQ but, but, has its issues. Yes. But Part of the issue is management, but part of the problem with KQ is managing the airspace also. Kenya managing mm. its own airspace. Mm. You know, as Michael said, some of these Middle Eastern airlines have such an open access that I think yeah. there are like five or six Middle Eastern airlines coming into Kenya, right. and one Kenya airline going to and coaching all the Kenya yeah. Airways people who've so, been trained here by yeah. Kenya Airways. The competition really is not a, on a level <laughs> field. No. And, or, uh, could, could, the, the, could, you, could you maybe uh, uh, you know hover around there and see what what are the issues? Because we've been actually talking about uh, Kenya Airways, but we've never really known what are the real issues. Is this the issues of management? Is this mm -hmm. the issue that yes, the changing times, of, but we still have the same template of strategy. There is a strategy misal misalignment. They are saying that now we should headhunt uh, a CEO that you know has an aviation uh, background. In comparison to Titus Naikuni, he had no. Uh, bearing, you know, with aviation at all as, as, as a CEO then. So what is the difference if we bring in a CEO who has an aviation uh, aviation e experience, right? That, will it make any leak of sense? Titus so, Nankuni had been PS Transport and Communication. Yes, he had, he had some background. PS he did yes, been but, involved but, with but, the railways. That is a far cry for management of, of, okay, of the, the aviation industry yeah. as well, right? Uh, uh, yeah? Uh, well, um, of course, as PS, uh, uh, first of all, he was on the board. Uh, but also, as PS, you have an overall view, uh, not just of aviation, but what is happening in transportation overall. I think, Dibal, the, the, if we cast back the debate from when KQ started having some trouble, on this very show, we suggested that we need to think of an intervention of up to 50 billion shillings. And, and we justified that uh, because of the economic role of KQ, uh, uh, and, and what, therefore, uh, I, I absolutely agree with Mike that uh, it is not just any company. It plays a, a very significant role um, in, in very many, uh, you know, areas uh, in terms of this economy. So, and, and I think our intervention so far is up to about 20 billion shillings. Yeah. Now, so you go back then to question, what is wrong? You know, I think various people have suggested different things. As you say, misalignment of strategy. And Gabriel is right that uh, government perhaps was too rebroy in terms of allowing all the other players a uh, certain leeway. And of course, the Middle Eastern Airlines, and even as far away uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, near Asia, mm -hmm. uh, many of the airlines uh, enjoy substantial uh, government support. Absolutely. Yeah which essentially KQ, you know, doesn't quite get the same sort of... Guessing uh, point is the top airlines. Yeah. Uh, doesn't well, get... Top airlines doesn't get any. From the government? Not a single penny. Oh, really? Not a single yeah. penny. So... Corporatized completely. Oh, really? In and fact, it, Emirates, it's money. Uh, Emirates is saying they're being misrepresented yeah. as well. Yeah. They're saying that not they a single are not penny. Exactly. <laughs> so this was a misrepresentation as well. Emirates advantages... Cost of fuel. On fuel. Yes, cost ah, of yes. On fuel. Okay. Yes. Not direct cash payment. Yeah. So a airlines not a single penny. Mm. To the contrary, it plows money back into the treasury. So yes. we, 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 we yeah. have a lot really learned, yeah. to learn from Ethiopia Airlines. So is it because they were first out of the gate? Because we had, you know, I mean, just to, you know, during that era, he really, uh, but, he really mm -hmm. like uh, invested a lot in aviation. So the experientially, they could be the on the learning curve. Ethiopia is uh, far Actually, ahead do you know there are some interesting... Could we hear, yeah, could we hear from Malik and then we come yeah. to you? So, so Ethiopian Airlines has been a fierce competitor. I think we've also got to contextualize the fact that Kenya Airways, I remember 10 years ago, there was no competition. I wanted to go to Kinshasa 10 years ago. I remember my economy class ticket cost me $2,000 return, right? There was so much P&L in that business 10 years ago, it was incredible. You had much more competition come in. You had a number of big things happen. They loaded up on airplane orders, and then we got hit with terrorism, so the demand dropped off. Mm. Suddenly they were getting all these planes. 
But let's make no mistake, massive mismanagement happened yeah. within that organization. Uh, fuel hedging, which was done for no other purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no logical purpose behind it uh, uh, during that time. There were a number of things that happened. Which, And now I've got to say, I give Michael Jersey full credit. He sees it as a legacy issue. I wish more people saw it as like that. He really wants to have you know, his name on the back. I came in and I fixed it. And then finally, there was some debate about talent. Look, we're in a global competition for talent. We have to be open-minded. If somebody is brilliant in the airline business, bring them in, pay them, let's get them. We, I don't care if he's white, yellow, brown, I don't mind. We should, this is the way you've got to be thinking across the board. It's such a competitive world out there. We've got to, we got to use the entire world as our talent pool if we can. So I'm, I, I'm hoping that, they're going to, that he's going to pull this uh, uh, rabbit out of the hat. I think at least we got somebody who's now focused, understands, and is determined to make it happen. Right, but do we just, we just come in from, on the... Let's hear from Mike. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's hear yes, from I Phyllis. Want, <laughs> I wanted to say that Project Mawingu, which was the growth strategy that KQ put in place, was a very ambitious strategy. And it was based on hub and spoke, where you bring in people into Nairobi, fly them to West Africa, and fly them around Africa. But what happened with the competition is that other airlines from the Middle East started flying directly to these countries. Mm -hmm. So that completely mm -hmm. distorted that strategy, and they didn't react quick enough to that. The fuel hedging, the inefficiencies within the organization. When they did an audit, they realized that products were being supplied to KQ at almost double or triple the prices in, right. in a number of cases. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of wastage. Uh, also the cost of their crew, because there was a lot of labor unrest and pushback from the crew, and every time KQ would give in to the demands. So that led to a very huge wage bill. And uh, that actually contributed a lot in terms of the cost. If you look at the cost of operation for Ethiopian, their pilots and crew are, play, are paid much less mm -hmm. than KQ pilots and crew. So over the years, that has piled up in terms of the cost of operation. And the fact that we didn't change that strategy quick enough has put us where we are. But the reality is an airline is a strategic asset. The other thing, by the way, in Africa, because airlines are operated on bilateral air service agreements, mm -hmm. you, you fly according to the rights you have negotiated as a country. Ethiopia has better rights within Africa. Mm -hmm. They have better access. We would mm -hmm. negotiate, I worked in KQ for seven years, mm -hmm. we would negotiate traffic rights and in certain places you get one uh, flight a week. Mm -hmm. That doesn't give you the ability then to fly in and you then have to partner with the local airline. In the process you're not growing your own airline. Mm -hmm. You're partnering with others and not able to grow as much. Right. The agreement with KLM. So there's a that's host a, of issues that That's contractual agreement, maybe yeah. in closing before, because we've got a, around the five minutes just to wind up and not even discuss EPA. W was that also uh, a spawning ground for, you know, KQ really going down the tubes? Because it seems this contractual agreement was very skewed in favor of KLM. No, I think KLM is being uh, scapegoated here. Really? Um, uh, Michael Joseph is making this a big priority quietly uh, and non-confrontationally to renegotiate certain aspects of the agreement. But I think this has been more of a political, uh, easy scapegoat to blame someone out there for problems such as those that have been identified here. I think that that's wrong and it's, it's unfortunate and I'm hoping, I'm hoping we're overcoming it quietly without making a noise. KLM, I think, has been a good partner. I think it can continue to be a good partner. Part of this recovery turnaround is to get more partners, I hope regionally as well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But uh, no, not KLM. Not KLM. No. Let me just come in uh, very quickly, Dubai. Yes. Uh, three things. One is, I think everyone has talked about the strategic misalignment on route and price. Route and price. I think uh, KQ had, uh, Phyllis said, perhaps had a very ambitious plan, expanded uh, without necessarily adjusting the pricing and the negotiated tariffs and so on. Mm -hmm. So root on price. The second is the labor issue, labor burden. Very high, extremely high, very strong union that's holding back the, 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 the airline from uh, doing what it needs to do. Uh, the lack of strong airspace management by the government of Kenya itself. And I think this is something that, that they need to do. And then lastly, the, mis, the mismanagement within the institution. Mm -hmm. The solution, in my view, and, and, and uh, I hope Michael is listening, is that the real competitor to KQ is not Ethiopian Airlines. It's Emirates, it's, it's, it's uh, Qatar, it's uh, I, I Fly agree. Dubai, it's I, this I, I, and I that. And, and agree. Yeah, and <laughs> this, you know, my view is 
ET and KQ need to sit together and say, how do we protect our airspace and make sure that yes. they don't put both of us? You know, I spoke to the CEO of Kenya, uh, Ethiopian Airlines, mm -hmm. and he said to me, mm -hmm. we need KQ more than Kenya needs KQ. Yeah. Because if there's no KQ to to today, there will be no ET tomorrow. You got a deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to bring these two airlines together. together. And there's some conversation already underway around this. All right. And by the way, there's some concern that Ethiopian is buying too many planes without knowing exactly how it's going to fill them or where they're going to fly. We are financing some of them, so <laughs> we're, we're looking very closely at their projections. And, 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 and so the other thing is, if we, we need as Africa to fully implement the Yamasukro Declaration, yes. because as long as there's no free movement within Africa and liberalization yeah. of the airspace, we will never grow African airlines. Other airlines will come from outside Africa and fly more in Africa yeah. than we are ourselves. They put us out of business. Yeah, they and put, put all of us out of business, business. Yeah. Mm. including mm. ETKQ, yeah. SAA, yeah. and yeah. everyone. Okay, together, we, we together. will be remiss if we don't talk about also Donald Trump as well. I think I had so many, yeah, yeah. So many things mixed into this. <laughs> 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 we might really have to leave uh, one of them no, out. But there is something useful out of your task force. I mean, it looks like yeah, ET and KQ might very well cooperate. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is yeah. Yeah. from the task force. Yeah. I mean, that is very good. Okay. All right, allow me just to see also crossover, we take a look on, on how also internationally we are bound to be affected by the Trump transition. And uh, uh, we have the story of uh, the US president, if I might just uh, turn to my camera seven so that I may have my auto cue there to read that particular story, where US president-elect Donald Trump has said that he plans on repealing and president replacing elect. President, <laughs> president Barack Obama's signature healthcare legislation legislation, I should say, as soon as the Secretary of Health and Human Services is confirmed. Trump said he will not wait for negotiations with Mexico to be completed before starting to build a wall along the two countries' border. He said his vice president-elect, Mike, Mike Pence, is leading an effort to get final approvals through various agencies and through Congress for the world to begin. Sit back and let them hang with it. <laughs> All right, already now is. Running roughshod on the, on the policies of uh, Obama legacy as well, uh, looking at what Obama had done for the, uh, the we can look at the charms and uh, also the disappointments of his tenure as we're winding up but briefly. Now he is on it. We've, we've seen also him uh, saying or rowing back on his promises. First of all, he said, we're going to build the Mexico uh, border wall and they're going to pay for it. Now he's gone to Congress to ask the Congress to actually pay for uh, the Mexican border. So uh, was it just uh, a political posturing? to unfavor with the uh, populace and the voters but now the reality is yeah uh, on the ground the reality on the ground is that he's a president and he cannot meet these promises briefly briefly let's begin there just Great, when Mike. you're giving castle remarks as winding up mike Eldon. yeah i mean with trump he's continuing to behave as the candidate we saw this with his whole style in his press conference yesterday um the encouraging thing is that the uh, people who have been in front of the Senate hearings for confirmation have uh, been rather reassuring in saying, no, if it's against the law, if it messes things up, we yeah. won't do it. Mm -hmm. We'll persuade um, the president uh, to not go ahead with it. If he insists, I'm prepared to resign. These kinds of reassuring statements uh, I liked <coughs> hearing. But Trump himself, he still needs to cool. Right. He was a person of the year 2016. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Time, Time, Time Magazine uh, yeah, picked yeah, him. Yeah. At I thought the, it was Matiangi. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the Kenyan section, yeah, Matiangi yeah. was. Uh. Time Magazine picked him. But listen, on Trump, uh, the best thing we can do is let us see what he does, not what he says. You know, uh, when you are in an election year, you, uh, the rhetoric goes in all directions. But as he begins to settle in, you look at his appointments, some moderate, some to the left, some to the, mostly to the right, but let us see what he does. Thank and you. I think there will be middle ground somewhere. Uh, Thank you. To let's, let's give him time, briefly. Was Absolutely. Um, look, uh, he made fantastical claims, like, say, the wall. I mean, how are you really going to make uh, Mexico uh, pay for it? I mean, practically. Now, and of course, uh, unfortunately, electioneering, and you will see it here uh, in the next few months, mm. people making very fantastical claims. Um, and the citizen, the poor citizen, hasn't really uh, the tools to analyze it 
and they may very well make that decision. So I absolutely agree with Gabriel. Let's see what he does. Um, but yes, many of the claims he made were fantastical. Uh, the the rational rationality would have said Thank you. they cannot be done. Thank you. But there we are. Phyllis. Election promises are that, promises. I agree, let's see what he'll actually do on the ground. For Africa, we can't clearly tell today what plan he has for Africa. So let's wait and see how it unfolds. We hope it doesn't, or let's wait and see if it pushes Africa further into China and the relationship with China. Because that actually determines how uh, we'll relate with China, the way America decides to treat Africa. Right. Right. Wait I and see. All right. You know, I haven't been such a thrill seeker since Trump has come in. Every morning I wake up, what's yeah. he said, what's happened? You know, it's so exciting, but it's so incredible. It's mind boggling. But the important point to note is this is a global thing. It's going all across the world, that the, the vo voting in Trump, Brexit. Where is it going next? Europe, fortress Europe, Madame Merkel is surrounded. And who, you know, people, who is behind this? Who is the father figure of all this? Vladimir Putin. Let me leave you, the person of the year should have been Vladimir Putin because that guy is really, has, he, he had to fight off a low oil price. He's extended Russian power way beyond uh, its, its uh, 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 country and he impacted and influenced that in election and they're still talking about it, trying to work out how he did it. <laughs> we'll leave it at that note. Thank you very much, Mark Eldon, management consultant, also uh, the uh, chair of the board of KCA University. Also, thank you very much, Negeru uh, Gabriel, who is the regional director of African Development Bank. Also, Negeru Tumaridi, an economist, thank you very much for coming through. Phyllis Wakega, CEO of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We appreciate also your input and Alec and Sachu for national analysis. Thank you very much for coming through. We hold this uh, particular forum next month also. We try and see how the shilling will be doing. If you, we will be holding still. We're eagerly <laughs> awaiting to see that. Thank you very much. <laughs>